Stephen, uh, thank you so much for joining us for this first in the new series of, of Law and Sport, Sports Law TV or Sports Law Show. I'm not sure what we're going to call it as yet, so we'll decide that as we go. Um, the objective of what we're trying to do is basically give people a, a true insight into what some of the real issues are that are impacting on sport from experts who work in sport. Because as you know, um, uh, there's a huge demand for people to work in the sports sector, uh, particularly from the legal side of things, and therefore there's a lot of talk and a lot of, uh, particularly covered by the mainstream media, and sometimes we don't get down to what are the really important issues. So Stephen, you've got a really interesting background. Uh, you've gone from private practice now to this role as, and forgive me if I get this right, Director of Integrity, Governance and Partnerships at Genius Sport. Um, so I wondered if you could first of all describe what your role is and, and maybe for those people who aren't familiar with Genius Sport, describe what the organisation does and then I'd love you to just give us a bit of a, a brief overview of what your journey was into that role. Yeah sure, so um, Genius Sports is a, essentially a technology company that works very closely with sports so it takes um, really innovative technology uh, coupled with um, official sports partnerships to basically allow sports to um, collect distribute and commercialise their uh, their sports data rights. Um, so that's part of my role, so actually working as the liaison between that part of the business and, uh, and, the, and, and, and working out what it is that sports want and how to deliver that. And the other part, which is equally uh, important or, 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 or quite related, um, because a lot of the commercialisation happens within the betting sector and, and supplying data and, and, and content to the betting industry uh, for sports, is around integrity. So it's about understanding that if sports are going to engage with uh, with the betting industry um, and, uh, and actually even if they're not just just generally betting is going to happen yeah. whether whether the sports approve it or not but actually working with them to actually manage some of the integrity risks that they may face by uh, by looking at things like education programs um, bet monitoring uh, rules and regulations so it's it's really helping protect the sports helping them to commercialize but also helping them with their with their integrity protection and so just briefly because you, you've got quite a, a, a lengthy career in the sports sector and then particularly dealing with mm. data uh, can you just describe what your background was and how you got into this role yeah I mean I've been really fortunate because I've worked with some of the, the you know learned from some of the best people in the in the, in the, in the sports or industry so I'm, I started off with my training contract work with Nick Patel and uh, who's CEO of the London Marathon chair of Sport England absolutely and uh, uh, one of the leading sports lawyers yeah my first job with him actually so I did um, uh, a summer play Placement um, with Nick, and uh, I mean Nick is, I think, brilliant, and, yeah, and just, very and just sharp. you know, and, and and also really passionate about sport. It's not just uh, about the law; it's about the you know law, commercial sports, about about. Yeah, he's a sports fan, he's undoubtedly. A sports fan. He's a, yeah, a sports massive fan. sportsman. Um, and uh, so I started off doing um, work on with ticket touts really around Wimbledon with him. And uh, I mean, he, uh, he, he kind of was the first person that, that sort of, I'd never heard of sports law before I did the, the sort of work placement with him and then uh, training contract with uh, what was Max Patel Green then. And uh, all around understanding how sport and law interact, but also understanding that not necessarily every answer has a, has a, a, a you know, a, a, as, a, as a legal solution. Yeah. I mean, some of the things that he did were just, uh, you know, truly innovative. Um, and so I started off doing that, then I, um, Upon qualification, I wanted to work a lot more in football, um, and I joined a firm that was then uh, Edge Ellison, became Hammonds, and worked again with some great people, Richard Alderson, who, who sadly died, uh, people like Peter Millerchip, uh, ended up working with Stephen Sampson, Jonathan yep. Taylor, uh, and about in the year 1999, I got involved in, a, in what was going to be a small project around a collection and exploitation of data for Football Data Co. So I went on to the first meeting of that in 1999 and they were my clients until, well, last year when I, when I kind of left the law. And that was all about collecting and exploiting sports data. And, and for those people who aren't familiar with Football Data Co, can you just explain who they are and what they do? Just to, yeah, so Football just to Data Co is owned by the Premier League and the Football League, uh, also as an arrangement with the uh, Scottish Professional Football League. And essentially what they, what they did right back from 1999 was recognise that sports weren't, certainly outside the US, very good at uh, at collecting, uh, protecting and commercialising their own data. So they established a structure that would actually give some uh, well, give some structure to that and, 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 and generate some significant commercial revenues. And so they, uh, they put systems in place to uh, work with partners to collect data, 
very fast data for the betting industry, but also richer data for performance and for media and to, and to um, power uh, club and, and league properties. And, and, and I started there. In, I started working for them in 1999, and uh, sort of 18, 17 years later, you know, they were still one of my one of my main clients. And, and what was quite interesting in that is when I when I kind of uh, when I kind of got involved in that, and I realised the potential. I realised all the betting and and all of the uh, people were collecting data and exploiting it without necessarily giving a fair return to sports. I went out speaking to everybody and said, you know, you should all be doing this. And uh, I spoke to lots of sports and everyone said, yeah, we're not <laughs> interested in that at all. We don't want to know about betting. We're not interested in that. Data's not really, uh, not, not really front and centre of what we do. And of course, over time, that has changed and uh, significantly a, yeah but for, for a while I was banging my head against a brick wall so I went and speak to sports and they said we're not talking to you about so yeah, it's not a priority we're for us we're not talking they about that but is, and then is that I think that's just generally an issue with innovation anyway because you know the people who are at the forefront of that who are engaged in it whether it's web development you know mm. the famously Blackberry with the iPhone saying that who's going to use touch screen <laughs> <Exactly, laughs> who's going to yeah. use touch screen you know unless you're the person with that vision or insight yeah. uh, you may not fully appreciate it particularly if your main function particularly in sport is really they're concerned about most of the people in sport because about obviously what happens on the field of play or on the track or whatever it may be yeah. and so you're distracted about it so what are you doing in your current role then well how does that you know how do you now you're harnessing on that knowledge that you've got on the business that you do how, you know, how are you imp implementing that within the business at the moment how does that differ to what you're doing in private practice I think what, what's quite interesting is the world actually did change sports didn't necessarily uh, recognise or acknowledge it so I mean even now there's an enormous amount of unofficial data collection going on um, people turning up in the venues or scraping data from websites or just watching it on TV and exploiting making commercial revenues and, and really taking um, data in directions that the sports may not necessarily approve of, certainly don't benefit from. So the world kind of the world kind of has changed, and most of the data schemes that I launched in my sort of uh, in my sort of previous previous role as a lawyer, you know, the, the official data set was actually a, a late entrance to the market. So unofficial data already existed. So one of the, I mean, one of the kind of the changes, the, the, the sort of the bit of a, a frustration for me and kind of what partly prompted my, my role was within Couchman's where, where I was, the, I was doing a lot more of the commercial, a lot more commercial work, um, you know, tendering a lot more data rights. But almost once the contracts are signed, then the sport went off and, and did their thing and I was kind of went, moved on to the next project. And, and I have a real passion for this and a real belief that, that, that sports should own their own data and should, um, and should commercialise that and control that and, and really develop long-term strategies for their data and uh, and that was a bit of I was kind of all the time the de deal was signed and I was anxious to know what had happened yeah, yeah. next but I was kind of a bit out of the picture so one of the things that really attracted me about Genius is that you know they have a real heritage of working with uh, grassroots sports so if you look when they merged with a business called Sporting Pulse that came out of Australia what that was all about was uh, was helping at the start, amateur basketball leagues manage their schedules, manage their time to make sure the referees got to the right places, making sure they were so resulted properly. Almost like a logi lo sorry, logistics. Exactly, sort of, sort of and that's what they, that's what they started uh, right. with. But then they that. moved on, and uh, what they did in the amateur sport became so uh, became the standard. And now they actually, I think, 180 worldwide professional basketball leagues they, they do this for. And, uh, you know, really helping sports to take control of, exploit, but also create long-term strategies for what they do with that data. And, uh, and to me, it, it, it felt like, uh, like, a, like a good step because I would be able to take my kind of development and my interest in data beyond just signing the contract into, into what happened next, but also just working with a, with a business that, that still had the same aims that I had, which was about official data official partnerships doing things the right way and so what's some of the legal challenges then that you you see because obviously you've got quite strong views on this about what sports should or should be doing and about this you know give something back mentality of you know you're essentially using something from sports so you should pay for that privilege so in theory I would presume so you can be invested back within sport yeah so what is with the, the sort of the global legal structure because what we're talking about here is not just what's domestically uh, in a domestic um, market it's an internationalized market so what is 
the, uh, what are the, the legal challenges that you're seeing and what do you see some of the future trends and developments in this space? Yeah, I mean, we have a patchwork, um, you know, in, in, intellectual property uh, rights landscape around uh, around around data. And in and, and actual fact, with, with, uh, with Football Data Co, you know, they were kind of, uh, they kind of spent a lot of time, money and effort um, trying to uh, disrupt and prevent people essentially stealing the data that they'd invested a lot of time, money and effort in, in collecting. Um, so, so, you know, uh, establishing IP rights, protecting the investment that, that sports might make in collecting and, 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 and exploiting that data is, is a, is a is real that, And is that around database rights? Is that uh, a lot of it is around database rights, but, you know, if you kind of go to various different jurisdictions, they have different concepts of, uh, of, kind, of, uh, of kind of the rights. I mean, so in the, in the UK, for example, there was uh, copyright and fiction lists for a long time that then disappeared but actually now in other places so I'm doing work in South Africa in Mauritius all over the world where the idea of uh, the, 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 the concept of copyright and fiction list still exists so you've got to kind of work with a, a whole multitude of different uh, of different uh, of different laws but the key bit really is around access so most of the most of the data that's collected the data that's really valuable has to be very very quick has to be very accurate and needs to be collected from within the venue so increasingly uh, working with uh, sports leagues and federations around um, access to venues, ticket conditions, ground regulations, to actually prevent access to the data or ability to collect the data. That's, that's, that's kind of one so, of the so, 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 so it's that licensing, you know, so you, again, if you purchase a ticket that you've got, you know, there's, there's particular conditions within that ticket that says you can or can't do certain things on in, within the venue. Yeah, exactly. um, so that, does that mean then you're working with other third parties, so who are, you know, technology companies who maybe have the technology to, I don't know, track player, players and so forth, so, and then you you guys are then process the guys who process that data. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. And also, I mean, there's, uh, I mean, in terms of the some of the, the 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 data collection and disruption mechanisms, you know, there are companies out there that identify unofficial data collectors within venues and disrupt that. I mean, in the betting industry, that that you know, the 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 big problem you have is in, in the betting industry to a large extent they don't really care whether it's official or unofficial um, at the moment. It's changing, and there's a lot more reputable operators. But essentially, it's about how fast and accurate that data is and if it's unofficial fast and accurate that actually has value and it's about changing uh, educating changing the mindset but also you know trying to really develop some of those data sets so they have more value by being official so one of the things that's quite interesting is around the the tracking technology uh, and you know some of the uh, some of the wearables which is, which is a really interesting space and actually quite hard to replicate on, on an unofficial basis and, and what do you think there's an appetite for um a harmonised international standard for the protection of intellectual property rights, particularly in some of you know, because I know that in Japan they've they've got certain issues as you alluded to in other jurisdictions, China another one, where they, you know the, particularly the the sports organisations or the governing bodies, in particular the leagues, are saying you know, we've got a real hard time here of actually uh, being able to protect our rights, and so therefore the, whether it's the broadcast or whether it's the data itself is being exploited. Do you think there's going to be at some point some sort of Harm, a more harmonised standard, a bit like you know, the New York Convention on um, arbitration. Do you think there'll be a minimum? I'd like to think so, but I don't see. I don't see it happening. To be honest, I mean, I. I, I so I, I, you're saying I'm living in a dream world. <laughs> well, I, it's, a, it's a dream world where I'd like to live because I think I think it's absolutely right. And, and ultimately, the, the thing that the thing that kind of I think is sometimes forgotten is you know ultimately you know sports have real funding issues and people off, quite often focus on the very top level and they say these these sports are, are, are supremely well funded. But the reality is, is if that if the if the if the unique content that they that they produce and they create, be it uh, video or be it data, is actually able to be just exploited free of charge without any fair return coming back to the sport, ultimately the sport suffers, and and actually it does make the difference between some events happening or not happening. And it and it's uh, to me, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a funding issue, it's a control issue, and uh, and the idea that all of this content and that there are plenty of people I hear saying you know, this content should be free available and sports so special and sports so important but without funding uh, then uh, it doesn't that happen. doesn't exist. Yeah, it, it doesn't, doesn't exist. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that, that's what all of this control and, and commercialization of content's about. Well, I think you're right. It's, and I always, and I, and I pipe on about this all the time, which is that sports are shard in terms of there's a very small number of players in the market that have got good investment and good sums of money and everyone else is really scraping around for whatever they can get um, and the commercialization of sport is still in its, in its infancy. Mm. Um, this is actually though why the data rights have become so interesting. So, for, so for, um, 
there's kind of a, an interesting process going on where what makes um, data rights, particularly fast data rights for betting, valuable to uh, to the betting industry isn't necessarily the same things that make um, TV rights valuable. So if you are um, a, a sport that plays at a particular time of day, uh, you have particular volume, um, you actually can be quite valuable to the betting industry. Uh, your your live data can be, and then some of the deals that I that I did uh, as I was finishing with Couchman's, you know, some of those deals were actually more valuable than the domestic TV deals that they did, their, their data deals, because they the market for you know a particular football league is not necessarily their domestic well, market. I know the MLS, they said that the, their actual, this is years ago, um, their general counsel uh, gave a talk at the Sports Lawyers Association, which you've, you've spoken at and I've been mm. we're partners with, yeah. and they were saying, he said something really interesting was that their broadcasting rights, went for international rights, went up in value because of the betting market, yeah. because it allowed... Um, allowed uh, an opportunity for those um, areas of the world where they weren't having major sporting events taking place to actually participate in the betting activities. And some of these places were licensed, obviously, and some of them weren't. Well, there's a really interesting debate going on in the US at the moment, if you saw, with, with kind of uh, falling uh, TV viewership for the NFL. Yeah. And the um, the AGA, the American Gaming Association, came out and, and, and did some research with, I think, Nielsen and found that, on average, the people that bet on American football watched 19 more games a season than the guys that didn't bet. And there is this, there is this concept of... Um, of, of betting as a way of, of penetrating new markets or developing new new interests. I don't think it should be the sole strategy, but there, but there is, and whether sports accept it, whether they want to engage with it or not, the reality is people will bet on their sports. And this is what happened really in the data space, is the fact that you know sports that didn't engage with betting and, and, and said, okay, it's not going to happen, what actually happened is somebody came in, collected the data and exploited the betting. And, and this isn't good. It's not yeah. good for revenues for sport, but also it's not good for integrity because they, they lack the ability to have visibility, to have any degree of control, to have any type of information exchange. And so this betting is going to happen anyway. So on that point, it leads nicely on then to the, the integrity issues. And mm. I don't really like the term integrity because I just think it's used banned about so much. And I just don't think it's that actually that helpful because mm. there's, it, it's, a broad, it's a broad definition and mm. it covers so many. It can cover anti-doping, it can guarantee uh, bribery, it can, uh, you know, um, can counter uh, match manipulation and yeah. so forth. But from a, um, a data perspective, if we were talking specifically about uh, the risk of, of interfering with a sporting outcome, let's say, um, how useful is that data and what, again, Who's doing a good job of using that data, uh, or you know? And do you think is anyone setting the standard with using that data, or is there a lot of work still to be done in terms of how that data is utilised to make sure that the the um, uh, sports competitions aren't corrupted? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, the the sort of the data and the monitoring of betting markets, you know, this is something that that Genius is uh, Genius Sports is quite uh, you know passionate about. And so we're, we're providing a, a lot of these services to people like uh, Major League Baseball and also through Data Code for the for the English leagues and monitoring betting markets, looking for unusual or suspicious uh, betting uh, um, patterns, um, which is part of the of, of the gathering the evidence in order to to undertake um, investigations. Some of the monitoring is really useful, even on a very basic level because it allows people to know that they are being watched and I don't think it, I don't think it eradicates uh, match manipulation entirely but it may mean that they move on to, uh, to, to, to softer targets. So it's, it's just creating awareness so is that the point of the you, you, it's something you have within your conscience that you think okay when we're shaping you know, from my perspective mm. from, a, from a broader sports law perspective you think it will help shape more and, and inform better decision making around the regulations and the governance of the sport because you it's something you acknowledge as a, pro, a potential risk at least when you're looking at your just imagine when sports governing bodies or leagues or clubs look at their risk register they say this is something that is um one of those risks how can we manage that risk effectively yeah exactly i mean part of it i think again is just accepting the fact that betting is going to happen on the sport whether you have a direct engagement as a sport or not you know putting adequate rules and regulations in place i think there's been a lot of focus on on athletes and and education which i think is really good i'm not necessarily sure that that athletes have been properly brought into the dialogue be, uh, you know around around how we actually combat match fixing i think with, there's also a, a need to really understand that 
that what we're talking about here is is generally organised crime networks, and this is why you know the, the, these these networks are really well funded, they're really organised, and they operate on an international basis. And so I think our response to uh, issues of match manipulation need to also be really well funded, really well coordinated, and on an international basis, because quite often you know the match will take place in one country that will be organised in a completely different country, the bets will be placed in another country. And there's more data issues around that about how you you pass the data, the the intelligence essentially, the evidence well, uh, yeah. across jurisdictions. I mean, the information exchanges are really. I mean, it's quite interesting. So we, there's, there's the, um, we were at the Council of Europe a few weeks ago talking about the Macklin Convention, and and still we we get to the point where even where there's a, a, a real willingness and a desire to share information, we still have again patchwork data protection laws, which actually mean that quite often a lot of this information cannot be shared. I mean, there's some interest. There's some really good developments happening. Well, an example would be the safe harbour sort of ruling as well in the states. You know, there's something like that could, can just all of a sudden yeah. to stop data being transferred yeah. across. Quite simply, even if you're you know, and if you're not participating in the discussions, yeah. then you've got no way of making sure that you do have access no, exactly. to those. I mean, right. there's interesting, interesting. interesting things happening. So if you look at something like the UK Gambling Commission, where now in terms of their their, te their license conditions, yeah. they require bet licensed betting operators in the UK to notify sports bodies if they um, if they notice a breach of rules or or, or, or something unusual or suspicious. Uh, but again, the, the big problem with again, this comes down to is funding as well, because what this actually does is put yet more pressure and obligation on sports to, uh, to, to, to deal with these issues, to investigate them. And having worked with, uh, with, with, uh, with uh, some quite small sports, you know, having an integrity issue or even an allegation that comes from the media, you know, this is an enormously time-consuming and expensive issue to deal with. Very, very important, but the funding issues really need to be addressed because it makes it very, very difficult for small sports. Yeah, I think you raised so, so two points I just wanted to flag there that you raised, which I think was athlete involvement rather than just athlete engagement. So you're saying, yeah, here, here, do you know this is an issue? Yes, we know it's an issue. Thanks, see you later. Mm -hmm. It actually get them involved in some of the processes. And I think... Um, Ben Rutherford, who we discussed before we started doing the interview at World Rugby, was saying that one of the things they did around the World Cup was really speak to the athletes, and they spent a lot of time you know, working with the player associations, but speaking to individual athletes to build up trust and to get their feedback on it as well, which I think just seems like quite a sensible... Uh, but doesn't a, happen a, in a... It just doesn't happen. I mean, this, this, this is the ridiculous thing about it is, you know, one of the one of the best things I saw was in terms of, of the stuff, some of the stuff that cricket's doing, where they actually have, you know, cricketers who've been involved in match fixing, who've been approached, uh, you know, actually talking, about how, how it actually happens. And how much do you think this issue is, and again this is less legal, but this is some of the practical, so because it seems to me, listen to you talk, we've got this situation where you, and this is a typical uh, lawyer's question I guess, um, yeah, you've got the reality, you've got the law that's in place and then you've got uh, how do we work with that, <laughs> whether it's like more on a commercial aspect, we discard some of these things and you know, obviously mm. within, the, what is le within the realms of what is legal, but we go, okay this has not been effective, so this has come to a commercial solution to the problem, yeah. and it's just one of those things where you say, you know, you have to address the reality of the situation, so you may have the law and the, and the the regulations in place, and ideally, no one would be involved in match fixing, no one would be in, in doping. The reality is, people are, therefore, we shouldn't just uh, cast them off. We should try and learn from that and say, right, how can we get them to, to tell others not to do it? Which is just a, a very, it seems to be a very effective and um, not very expensive way to, to deter people from match fixing and, and, and may actually come to some workable solutions as well. well I agree. I mean, I think prevention is really, really important. Um, and and the, the, the hard part is that, that you know, even if you, t if, you take the, if you take the law and the, uh, particularly the criminal law, you know, the, the, the truth is that, that for all the talk, match fixing, match manipulation. Yeah, so if you look at in kind of in terms of the the criminal law, the, the truth is that that round the world match fixing is not seen as a as a legislative priority. It's not seen as a as a as a as a as a criminal uh, priority, you know, the, the, these issues are very, very complex, and uh, you know, law enforcement d does its best, but to, to sometimes the, the law just doesn't exist. You know, match fixing isn't isn't a criminal offence in every jurisdiction, and even where it is, they're incredibly time uh, consuming and yeah. expensive, and yeah. so it, so it doesn't happen. So I think you've got to focus on education, you've got to focus on prevention, and and and, and that has to have uh, that has to have athlete involvement. It, it, it just has to because the routes. To Two match fixing are quite uh, multifaceted. You know, people. Some of it's greed. Yeah. Some of it's stupidity. 
to be honest. Some of it is, is, is blackmail, some of it's peer pressure. There's a lot of different routes of how you end up becoming involved in, a, in, in match fixing. And I'm not necessarily sure that, 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 that many sports are investing the time and the effort in actually educating and working with participants. And on that point, how much do you think uh, good governance plays a, a key point because what we're talking about really with athlete engagement as one of the stakeholders as many others is it's just a principle of good governance surely yeah well it's I mean it's a, it's the issue that's kind of facing sport generally I mean I think this this fits into the whole issue of of the governance of sport and looking at some of the structures that as big amounts of money are coming in as as sports become much more global players the truth is they haven't really and we with some notable exceptions you know if you look at kind of their equivalents in business, they don't have the same levels of transparency, accountability. You know, the issue of you know the idea of non-executive directors within sport has been uh, you know an anathema. And and I, and, I, and I think that sport, you know, as much as I don't want sport to just to be about business, when you are talking about significant amounts of money, when you're talking about you know quite complex commercial relationships. You need to have that, and 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 it's and it's not as simple as a, a you know that the, the the stakeholder uh, involvement in sport is very different to to, to 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 shareholders, but still you need to involve all the people w within that, and I I think there's a there's, there's there's a real need. I mean, I think it's a slight, uh, more of a trend, particularly domestically anyway. With with yes, I think earlier this week the uh, UK Sport and Sporting England released their new uh, code of governance, in which I think they acknowledge some of this, and I think we're starting to make progress here. I know again, as you said, there's certain exceptions to this, but um, I think, as you were saying, that some sports are not that well funded and not that well resourced. I can totally understand why um, certain sports are struggling to cope with some of these issues because they just don't have the, the manpower of such. I mean, it's quite interesting because what it actually all of this seems to come down to when you look at all of these issues, you talk about you talk about doping, you talk about uh, you talk about. Um, um, diversity, you talk about um, integrity, match manipulation, governance. What this all comes down to, I think, is this issue around funding for sport. I think almost all of it, you know, comes down to funding for sport. And there, there is a problem, I think, in that generally people go, oh, sports are incredibly well funded, they make an awful lot of money. And at some level, that's absolutely true. But actually, as you, you, you don't have to scratch very far beneath the surface, and, and a lot of sports are actually, you know, rely a lot on on volunteers, on on, on an enormous amount of people putting in an enormous amount of work for no reward whatsoever, and and they have funding. Um, they have funding issues yeah. and what, where, where are they going to put their money? Are they going to put it into increasing participation, into governance? The truth is the whole concept of funding for sport really needs to be looked at, which kind of brings it right the way back to why I think it's very important that sports are able, where they have rights in data, in their own video, whatever, that there needs to be a proper legal framework in order for them to be allowed to exploit those and derive commercial revenues. And, from a, and an education. This is, again, one of the reasons Laurie Sport was set up was for this education perspective to say, you know, unless you can, sport women will not improve in terms of its governance standards or, or uh, their ability to commercialise, unless all of the people who are participating in that, particularly who are working within an organisation, understand the value of what they're doing and also understand their rights. And whether it's an athlete who understands their rights, understand yeah. the commercial value they're bringing to the yeah. table, or whether it's the governing body. So, yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense. And I think that, um, yeah, have, at least having the data and having some visibility of it is going to is definitely going to be a, a, a positive step, at least, to, 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 to changing maybe the, some of the mentality or uh, expertise that people may have. Yeah, there, there needs to be definitely more, you know, open conversation. One of, one of the things I think is great about, about law and sport is it is open and it does kind of, you know, give out give out the information yeah. so that people actually understand, you know, the, the, the developments that are happening in other sports. Because I think that when, when I first started out in, in, in sports law, there was a lot more debate and dialogue and people sharing knowledge and experience. You know, I used to remember going to conferences and people would say, oh, we've developed this new policy on child protection and, and it would be circulated and everyone would talk about it. But now, I, I think until quite recent, there's been quite a lot of, of jealous guarding of, of, of information and, and a lot less sharing of information, even between sports. And I think that's I think that's something that needs to change if we're to really move on. Well, there's um, I'm trying to think who who is um, uh, De uh, 
Daniel Kahneman, is it? Or Kahneman, who wrote the book Thinking Fast and Slow. Okay. And uh, he talks about when you introduce money to a certain situation, basically people become um, a lot more introspective. Mm. So they did an, an experiment where they had yeah, people in a class and someone dropped, uh, uh, um, uh, someone dropped a, a pencil on the, f- uh, an old lady dropped a pencil on the floor or something. And the, in the class where they were, the people weren't exposed to queues for money. So like they weren't seeing dollar signs or pound signs and big expensive cars and houses and so forth. They were more, the, they found that the people were more likely to help the old lady. Mm, they did it, which I think is really interesting because if you look at it from a legal perspective, again, most people, uh, I think I mentioned earlier that I was interviewing Michael Beloff QC when he was involved he was doing a lot of it because he was just passionate about sport and yeah he wasn't the money his, his other area of his business was much more lucrative for him so I think there was that um, I'm not saying it was a, a, a purist time or anything uh, I'm not suggesting that but I think at that point when people are doing it more because of you know they knew there wasn't that much value in it mm. um, maybe people were a bit more generous with their with their time and their, their information whereas now because people are building their practice groups particularly in private practice mm. on these areas yeah. naturally it means people are going to become more guarded because they think and this is one of the issues we have to ex- try to work with our authors on to say look it's better that you share this information it shows you as a thought leader rather than withholding that information and no one benefits from yeah. and also you just could leave the opportunity for someone else to come and share that information anyway yeah. so you know you may do all the hard work they may you know at some point find out about it and from a private network and then uh, start to build a profile on it publicly so you might as well own it you might as well own the conversation you might as well show that you've got knowledge and I think some of this as well is about is about the about the, the about the ethos you have I mean one of the reasons why I really was um, interested in joining um, in, in joining Genius Sport is because they absolutely act Accept that what what is actually important about this is is yes we want to make money and that's that's really important but we want to do it the right way and so it's quite interesting quite early on when I joined Genius we had a conversation about some rights that we could have officially for a certain amount of money but there was a way we could have got them unofficially and there'd be no money going back to the sport and it would have been more profitable and to me a real an, a, an important uh, justification of me deciding to join junior sports having spent 17 or 18 years working fighting for sports to have a fair return for use of their content the decision was taken within the business that we do it the right way we do it the right way you know it's about partnerships with sport it's about engaging with them it's about giving them a fair return and i think long term that's good business strategy Absolutely. because i think sports are starting to understand increasingly they need to protect and they need to work with people that are actually working in partnership with them to generate new revenues and it benefits us all because ultimately Absolutely. if we all steal from sports eventually there is no economic rationale for them taking place well, the same principle applies to sports sponsorship right if you're looking for as you the word was partnership so rather than just looking to acquire something you're actually looking to build partnerships which are uh, imply that they're generally going to be more meaningful and engaging and that both all the parties involved win essentially yeah. so you all benefit from it in terms then in the next 12 months or so what do you what are you going to be focusing your attentions on yeah. or where, where does you know is it more of the same or have you got some exciting projects you're going to be working on over the next 12 months yeah we've got some really exciting projects I mean so we're very uh, as junior sports are very strong in in basketball in uh, and in and in football we're doing quite a lot of work in esports which is really Really interesting in terms of there you're seeing the emergence of a, of a of an entirely new sports category which doesn't necessarily questionable whether it's a sport or not or gaming there there, but, but, but it, regardless it's, but, but, it's, but, but, it's with, but 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 you know where they're where they're now starting to look at some of the structures and what's quite interesting about this is is particularly because they see part of the way they're going to generate revenues off the betting market integrity is really kind of front and center so even these fledgling organizations are all engaging not just with us but with other operators as well in terms of looking at how they ensure the integrity of their, of their sports. So that, that's going to be one big issue. I think the other big issue for us, and we're, we're going on quite a lot of international expansion, and the US is, is, is really key critical. I mean, I think that if you'd have asked me five years ago, was the US market ever going to go up, open up in terms, of, uh, in terms of sports betting, I'd have said, maybe at some point in the very very distant future now i think within three years time then 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 sports betting will be legalized i think it's uh that's, I think a, it's that's, a, that's a game changer Amazing. That's a, yeah uh, yeah and I think it's interesting that um on that point I, I was talking to someone about that the market the u.s market and saying if you look at the internationalization of sports i don't think you can look at u.s sport without looking at the wider global context and uh, just as a, a principle of, of of corporations that they want to grow and major leagues obviously got their markets the NF, NFL, NHL, NBA, Major League Baseball uh, Major League now Major League Soccer and, uh, and Basketball the NBA 
they're looking for international expansion because they're not that they've saturated the market in America, but they've got you know, they've been well established and they've got their place in the market. So they're looking to to grow. Yeah. As you look to grow, then they they have to then start to engage with markets like the NFL over here, which allows betting and others and inevitably then um, you also start to compete with the Premier League and vice versa and with those sports that are allowing betting partners and sponsors yeah, you're a significant disadvantage if you're not doing that so I think that commercial pressure on them as well absolutely uh, is, and it puts pressure on the domestic sports as yeah. well I mean that's what's that's what's really quite interesting I think is that you know as, as, as people look to expand into new markets you know to what extent are they are they kind of you know going to take market share away from some of the local sports and it's quite a difficult balance that it's quite interesting when you look at some of the sports when they kind of go into place like China and engaging with local leagues as well which is quite interesting mm. um, but well, one of the one of the fast fascinating things for me in terms of the US sports is that you know they have absolutely been willing uh, to invest time and significant resources in um, integrity measures so you know they take it very very seriously they accept that whether they you know engage directly with the betting industry or not that betting is going to happen so over the, what have you got planned over the next 12 months what do you think is it, what exciting stuff are you going to be working on yeah and there's some re- I mean there's some really interesting things going on the business is growing pretty uh, pretty rapidly uh, I think we're now 18 offices in 14 different countries wow. and, and more planned so international expansions part uh, really rolling out a lot of the good products and the and the services that we provide particularly within basketball and football to uh, to other sports looking obviously at the emerging esports market so we've uh, we've uh, we're putting quite a bit of time and money into into that and and really uh, US the US is a, is a is a is a really kind of key focus we're doing a lot of uh, integrity work with uh, with major league baseball and we see the the, the sort of the the potential opening up of the US market has been something that that, 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 that we think is, is is likely to happen. Yeah, I mean, we talked earlier, didn't we, about the the pressures that inevitably with internationalisation of sport and as the major leagues start to compete with uh, leagues like the Premier League and the Liga and so forth and vice versa, that they're going to have to, you think anyway, open up their market because if they don't essentially have access to that betting market or the betting revenue um, then they're putting themselves at a significant disadvantage as some of the other leagues around the world. Yeah absolutely I mean so the, 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 so some of the revenues that have been generated are quite significant but also this idea again of, of, of kind of engaging or, or fans engaging through betting uh, that, that actually sometimes they, the very first engagement that someone has with the sport you know it, it might sound like heresy but actually could be through through betting and, and certainly as, uh, as some of these sports move into uh, European or other regular regulated betting markets, there's an expectation that, that people will be able to bet on their sports. So there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a philosophical uh, approach that, uh, or you know, a, a question that, that, that some of these sports need to address, but also a, a really commercial one. And some of these sports are, are really quite suited to, uh, to betting and could generate significant revenues. And as we go full circle back to where we started talking about already betting is happening on those US yeah. sports outside of the Absolutely. US anyway. So. We I talked about this with Kevin Carman so I, like years ago on a podcast saying it's it's um funny how you can the NFL's over here and you can go to go down the road and put a bet in Ladbrokes or one of the other betting operators and yet it's not not permitted in the US outside the the, the, the states that are covered by PASPA. And, no, and, and yet and yet you know still you know the the size of the American betting market I mean Nevada's a tiny proportion of that but you know the illegal gambling market within the US is absolutely huge. Well, uh, Steve, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. It's a pleasure speaking to you. Um, and hopefully, we can, you know, continue to try and make uh, the, the legal data issues or data legal issues um, slightly more interesting and engaging and relevant <laughs> to those in the sports market. Definitely. Thank you very much. <laughs>